And good evening, and welcome to our worship service this evening on Canada Day, the 1st of July, the day in which we celebrate Canada's independence, uh, its constitution, and also the great nation that we do in fact live in. We will be following the order for service of prayer and preaching found on page 260 in the hymnal, and also, of course, in the hymnal sampler that we've made available several times over. We begin on page 260. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And we speak the, post, the Old Testament canticle. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy will you draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Our first reading in the historic one-year lectionary comes to us from Micah, the seventh chapter. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast out all our sins into the depth of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading for this evening comes to us from 1 Timothy, the first chapter. I thank him who has given me strength Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to rise for the reading of the gospel. And the Holy Gospel comes to us this evening from St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. 
So he told them this parable, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, and sweep the house, and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we continue with the responsory. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. And we continue with the Catechism on page 264 with the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. And we continue with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we pray in our Lord's name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul teaches Timothy. Paul is Timothy's mentor. Paul is there to tell Timothy everything that he is going to need to be the pastor of the churches that he is going to serve throughout the time of his ministry. But part of the most important instruction that Paul gives to Timothy in this whole letter is nothing to do with administration, It is nothing to do with how to take records. It is nothing to do with how to run streaming or live broadcasting or any of those other things that we all wish that we would have had more time to learn while we were in seminary. No, some of the most important thing that uh, Paul says to Timothy is to let him know what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. 
We have him saying that here in the epistle reading, which I'll read for you again from 1 Timothy chapter 1, just the part that I'm interested in here, in talking about this evening, which is where he says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. One of the most important things that Paul can tell Timothy as his mentor is to tell him that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom, Paul says, I am the foremost. That is a simple, straightforward truth that is so important and yet so difficult to grasp that the vast majority of people who have ever lived have never quite figured that out. We know our need for grace. Or more accurately, we know our need for righteousness. When it says in the scriptures, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, we take that seriously. We know that we should be perfect. When we are not, we feel that sting. We feel that weight upon us, as though we should have done something differently, as though we should have behaved differently. We know that the weight of perfection is upon us all the time. Even people who are not and who have never been religious will still define and redefine goodness or righteousness or the right side of history or the right behavior, always, always, always trying to keep up with it. Nobody that I know defines goodness or righteousness or truth or the right side of history as the opposite of what they're doing. Everybody believes that they are doing a relatively good job. Everybody believes that they are doing well and that they should be the good guys, after all. But Paul's biggest revelation, his most simple and straightforward thing that he gives to Timothy, is to let him know and to remind him that Jesus Christ comes to save sinners. That is a simple point. It's not complicated. It should not even be controversial because that is the gospel message. Boiled down to its simplest point, Jesus Christ comes to save sinners. You know how John 3.16, the entire Bible in one verse, it says that point. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That notion that Christ Jesus comes to save sinners. But it is such a humbling thing to know yourself as a sinner that most people never do it. It is very difficult to cross that mental block that tells you that there are sinners out there and that you yourself are among them. It's so difficult and so complicated that, as I say, most people never do it. But in the Christian faith, we have a great gift in St. Paul. We really do. Because in St. Paul, you don't have a moral exemplar. You don't have him always having done the good and right thing. You don't get that with the disciples either. In fact, apart from Jesus Christ, you don't get anybody doing that throughout the scriptures themselves. You get adulterers and drunks and prostitutes. You get all these people who make bad decisions constantly. But in Paul, in Paul, you get somebody who actively persecuted the church. 
somebody who went out of his way to see the apostles of Jesus Christ persecuted and killed. The first time we see Paul in the scriptures, he is there at the execution of Stephen, watching everybody's coats while they throw rocks at him until he dies. And it specifically says in the scripture, and Paul approved of his murder. Paul is one of the most unlikely people to write the majority of the New Testament. A very unlikely person indeed, a passionate, ardent persecutor of God's church. Somebody who wanted to see the whole thing shut down and removed and taken away. Somebody who breathed out murderous threats against the disciples of Jesus Christ, who actively went out of his way to find them and to kill them. And it is Paul who is Timothy's mentor. And Paul tells Timothy something extremely important, which is to say to Timothy, Christ Jesus died to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost, of whom I am the chief. This is such liberating news. And you yourself are freed by it. You yourself are completely freed by that idea that you no longer have to pretend to be perfect and you no longer have to redefine what perfect is. You don't have to do any of that. Instead, you can say, in the same way that Paul did, Christ Jesus dies to save sinners, of whom he is the chief, he is the foremost, but we are right alongside him. We are people who do not keep God's law. We are people who have sinned grievously and have fallen short of the glory of God. We are people who don't do what we should and who do what we should not. And while we are busily trying to solve the problems of an entire world, while we are busy trying to undo scores of damage, while we are trying to make everything right on a large scale, we're neglecting the individual problems. We are not adequately saying, I myself am the problem, and I myself have done the things that I not, ought not to have done. Once you've done this, there's a great liberation that happens. As Paul himself found, as Paul himself found and passed on to Timothy, Letting Timothy know, and through Timothy, the rest of us, letting us all know that the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't depend on us being perfect. And the worst thing that we can do for the gospel of Jesus Christ is to pretend openly that it falls in line with what we are already doing. It does not. The gospel of Jesus Christ is certainly opposed to what we are currently doing. We are sinners through and through. That is the whole reason for Jesus Christ to have come to earth. The parables that we heard this evening of the lost sheep and the lost coin are parables of Christ finding and seeking and saving the lost. Parables of Jesus understanding that we had gone far astray. We were not going to find our way back. We were not going to be restored by ourselves. He had to go and free us himself. Being a Christian is not a matter of simply accepting certain rules or understanding and accepting that certain ideas are right. This is not a law. It is not a philosophy. It is neither of those things. And since it is Canada Day today, and I get to talk about the great nation in which we live, the laws of this country are not concerned with you as a moral person. The laws of this great nation are not concerned with are you a good or righteous person. They're only concerned with are you overstepping bounds? Are you committing crimes? And the laws of this country are there to punish you for doing so. But they make no positive statements. 
They do not tell you how you are to live. They only tell you what you are not to do. And in many ways, we have confused these sorts of laws for God's laws. But God's laws genuinely do care what you do. They genuinely do care what you do with the time that has been accorded to you here on earth. They care if you were good and right. They care if you were making good decisions and right ones. And they certainly care if you were feeding the hungry and uh, clothing the naked and visiting those in prison. It certainly and directly cares about those things. Because the most moral Christian life is not one spent in a coma. The most moral Christian life is the one that is actively and openly working in and for the kingdom of God. But when one does not, one needs to repent. Christ Jesus comes to save sinners who were not going to save themselves. You and I were never going to get to the point where we had made good decisions enough to avoid any kind of destruction. We really were not going to do that ever. That was never going to happen. That's why Christ Jesus had to come. That's why he had to come and find the lost sheep. That's why he had to come and turn the house upside down to find the lost coin. He is obsessed with finding and saving the lost, including you and me, the chief of sinners. And it all depends and revolves around understanding and knowing the reason for the gospel. Understanding and knowing that Christ comes to save sinners. To understand and to know that only by knowing and believing in that can you actually take any kind of principled stand. Because apart from that, any kind of principled stand you take will be undermined. If you have a simple, straightforward, principled stand of you shall not steal, and somebody points out, didn't you at some point steal a song online or swipe a movie online, and you will have to say, well, it's okay when I do it. Or, if you understand the gospel, you can say, I did that, and I should not have. But thanks be to God for saving me. Anything else will involve you rewriting your morals to fit your behavior instead of rewriting your behavior to fit your morals. But when you come to worship in God's house, when you say those words of confession of sins, when you say, I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by what I have done and by what I have left undone, I have not loved you with my whole heart and I have not loved my neighbor as myself. When you say those things and believe those things and bring those sins over to Jesus Christ and lay them at the foot of the cross, then you will understand what the gospel of Jesus Christ is and always has been all about, that he comes to save sinners, which is why Paul is such a good ambassador for this. Because nobody, Christian or otherwise, is going to hold up St. Paul as a paragon of virtue and say he always did the right thing and always made the right call. From the second we see him, we know that he doesn't. We know that he doesn't, and we know that his decisions were self-serving, and they were mean, and they were cruel. But in Paul, you don't have to deal with him as a paragon of virtue. You get to deal with him as an icon of repentance. And that's the good news, that Jesus Christ can take and redeem somebody even as fallen as St. Paul. That Christ Jesus can take and redeem even somebody who breathed out murderous threats against the disciples, somebody who approved of their killing and thought it was great, somebody who knew and understand his own righteousness, being the Pharisee of Pharisees and Hebrew of Hebrews, even that man, Jesus Christ, can redeem. And if Jesus Christ can redeem him, Jesus Christ can redeem you too. You lost and condemned person, you person who wants so much to be righteous but never wants to change, you individual Christian who bring your sins to the foot of the cross week in and week out, and say that confession of sins, know that Jesus Christ chose that cross because he was obsessed and desperate to 
find and to seek and to save sinners like St. Paul, like St. Timothy, like yourself, like myself. That is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds always in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we continue with the prayers found on page 265. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon, with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and dying and all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and all of our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty and ever-living God, because you hate nothing that you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent, create in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily repenting of our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain from you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we speak Luther's evening prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would keep me, forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. And we speak the New Testament canticle. Christ has been raised from the dead. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Raised from the dead, he will never die again. Death has no more dominion over him. Christ has been raised from the dead. Alleluia, alleluia. Dying, Christ dies to sin once for all. Living, he lives to God. Count yourselves as dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ has been raised from the dead. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you and preserve you. Amen. Thus concludes our service for this evening. Happy and joyous Canada Day to you, whatever your plans are and wherever you might be. Rejoice and give thanks for this nation that we live in, and work your best and hardest to keep and maintain it for all those who will come after us. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.